Chapter 52 Zhu Yu's anger at seeing that his rival Zhu Zhilian had surprised Nanjun, and at hearing the same news of Jingzhu and Zhang Yong was but natural. And this sudden fit of rage caused his wound to reopen. However, he soon recovered. All his officers besought him to accept the situation. But he said, What but the death of that bunk in Zhu Liang will assuage my anger? If Cheng Pu can but aid me in an attack on Nanjun, I can certainly restore it to the Southland. Soon Lu Su came in to whom Zhu Yu said, I simply must fight Liu Bei and Zhu Liang till it is decided which shall have the upper hand. I must also recapture the cities. Perhaps you can assist me. It cannot be done, replied Lu Su. We are now at grips with Cao Cao, and victory or defeat is undecided. Our lord has not been successful in overcoming Hafei. Do not fight near Hong, or it will be like people of the same household destroying each other. Should Cao Cao take advantage of this position to make a sudden descent, we should be in a parlous condition. Further, you must remember that Liu Bei and Cao Cao are united by the bonds of old friendship. If the pressure becomes too great, Liu Bei may relinquish these cities, offer them to Cao Cao, and join forces with him to attack the south. That would be a real misfortune. I cannot help being angry, said Zhu Yu, to think that we should have used our resources for their benefit. They get all the advantage. Well, let me go and see Liu Bei and talk reason to him. If I can arrive at no understanding, then attack at once. Excellent proposal, cried all present. So Lu Su, with his escort, went away to Nanjun to carry out his proposal and try to arrange matters. He reached the city wall and summoned the gate, where at Shao's island came out to speak with him. I have something to say to Liu Bei, said he. I wish to see him. My lord, and Zhu Jiang are in Jingzhu, was the reply. Lu Su turned away and hasted to Jingzhu. He found the walls bedecked with flags, and everything in excellent order. In his heart he admired the sight, and thought what an able person was the commander of that army. The guards reported his arrival, and Zhu Jiang ordered them to throw wide the gate. Lu Su was led to the government house and after the usual exchange of salutes, Zhu Liang and his visitor took their respective seats. Having finished the tea, Lu Su said, My master, Marquis Sun Quan, and the commander of his army, Zhu Yu, have sent me to lay before the imperial uncle their views. When Cao Cao led his huge house southward, he gave out that it was for the conquest of the Southland. But really his intention was to destroy Liu Bei. Happily, our army was able to repulse a mighty host and so saved him. Wherefore Jingzhu, with its nine territories of forty-two counties, ought to belong to us. But by a treacherous move your master has occupied Jingzhu and Zhaiyang, so that we have spent our treasure in vain, and our armies have fought to no purpose. The imperial uncle has reaped the benefits to the full. This is not as it should be. Zhu Liang replied, Lu Su, you are a man of high intelligence. Why do you hold such language? You know the saying that all things return to their owner. These places have never belonged to the South Land, but were of the patrimony of Liu Bio, and though he is dead, his son remains. Should not the uncle assist the nephew to recover his own? Could my master have refrained? If the nephew Liu Kai, the rightful heir, had occupied these cities, there would have been something to say. But he is at Jiangxia, and not here. Would you like to see him? said Zhu Liang. At the same time he ordered the servants to request Liu Kai to come. Thereupon Liu Kai at once appeared supported by two attendants. Addressing Lu Su, Liu Kai said, I am too weak to perform the correct ceremonies. I pray you pardon me, Lu Su. Lu Su said not a word. He was too much taken aback. However, he recovered himself presently and said, But if the heir had not been here, what then? The heir is living but from day to day. Should he go, then there will be something to talk about. Should he die, then you ought to return these cities to us. You state the exact facts, said Zhu Liang. Then a banquet was prepared, and that over Lu Su took his leave. He hastened back to his own camp, and gave Zhu Yu an account of his mission. But what is there for us in the chance of Liu Kai's death, said Zhu Yu. He is in his very first youth. When will these places fall to us? Rest content, general. Let me guarantee the return of these places. But how can you? asked Chu Yu. 
Liu Kai has indulged too freely in wine and women. He is a wreck and rotten to the core, miserably emaciated and panting for breath. I will not give him half a year's life. Then I will go to Liu Bei, and he will be unable to deny the request. But Zhu Yu was still unmollified. Suddenly came a messenger from Sun Quan, who said, Our lord is laying siege to Hefei, but in several battles has had no victory. He now orders you to withdraw from here and go to Hefei to help him. Thereupon Zhu Yu marched back to chasing. Having reached home, he began to give attention to the recovery of his health. He sent Cheng Pu with the marine and land forces to Hefei ready for Sun Quan's call. Liu Bei was exceedingly well satisfied with the possession of his new region, and his thoughts turned to more ambitious schemes. Then a certain man came to him to suggest a plan. This man was Ijai, and remembering the kindly feeling of other days Liu Bei received him most graciously. When Ijai was seated, and his host had asked what he proposed, he said, You wish for a plan to accomplish yet greater deeds. Why not seek wise people and ask them? Where are these wise people to be found? asked Liu Bei. Yijai replied, In this region there's a certain family named Ma, five brothers, all of whom are known as men of ability. The youngest is called Ma Su. The ablest is Ma Lian, who has white hairs in his eyebrows, and the villagers have a little rhyming couplet that means there are five sons in the family Ma, but white eyebrows is the best of them. You should get this man to draw up a plan for you. So Liu Bei told them to request his presence. Ma Lian came and was received with great respect. He was asked to suggest a plan for the security of the newly acquired region, and he said attacked as it is on all sides, this region is not one in which one is permanently secure. You should let Liu Kai remain here till he is recovered from his present illness, but the actual protection of the place is to be placed in the hands of trusty friends. Obtain an edict appointing him imperial protector of Jingzhu, and the people will be content. Then conquer ruling Changshu Giyong and Lingling and with the resources you will thus acquire, you will have the means for further plans. That should be your policy. Which of the four territories should be first taken? asked Liu Bei. The nearest Lingling, which lies in the west of River Xiang. The next is Wuling, and after these the other two. Ma Yang was given an appointment as Imperial Protector Assistant, with Yi Jai as his second. Then Liu Bei consulted Zhu Liang about sending Liu Kai to Zhang so that Guan Yu could be free to return. Next they made preparations to attack Lingling, and Zhang Fei was to lead the van. Zhao Zilong was to guard the rear, while Liu Bei and Zhu Jiang were to command the main body. A fifteen thousand troops were left to hold Jingzhu. Mai Zhu and Liu Feng were left to guard Jiangling. The governor of Lingling was Liu Du. When danger thus threatened, he called in his son Liu Xiang, and they discussed the case. The son was very self-confident, and said to his father, Have no anxiety. They may have the known and famous warriors, Zhang Fei and Zhao Zilong, but we have our leader Zing Darum, who is match for any number of men. He can withstand them. So Liu Xiang, with the famous leader, was entrusted with the defense. At the head of a full ten thousand troops, they made a camp about ten miles from the city, with the shelter of hills and a river. Their scouts brought news that Zhu Jiang was close at hand with one army. Xing Daran decided to check his advance, and went forth to oppose him. When both sides were arrayed, Xing Daran rode to the front. In his hand he held a battle-axe, called Cleaver of Mountains. In a mighty voice he cried, Rebels, how comes it that you have dared to enter our territory? From the center of the opposing army, where appeared a cluster of yellow flags, there came out a small four-wheeled carriage in which sat very erect, a certain man dressed in white, with a turban on his head. In one hand he held a feather fan, with which he signed to the warrior to approach. At the same time he said, I am Zhu Jiang of Nanyong, whose plans broke up the countless legions of Cao Cao so that nothing of them returned whence they started. How then can you hope to oppose me? I now offer you peace, and it will be well for you to surrender. Xing Daran laughed derisively, saying, their defeat was owing to the plan of Xu Yu. You had nothing to do with it, how dare you try to deceive me. So saying he swung up his battle axe, and came running toward Zhu Jiang. But Zhu Jiang turned his carriage and retired within the lines which closed up behind him. Xing Daran came rushing on. 
As he reached the array, the troops fell away on both sides and let him enter. Well within he looked round for his chief opponent. Seeing a yellow flag moving along quietly, he concluded that Zhu Jian was with it and so followed it. When the flag had gone over the shoulder of the hill, it stopped. Then suddenly, as if the earth had opened and swallowed it up, the four-wheeled carriage disappeared, while in its place came a ferocious warrior. With a long serpent halberd in his hand and mounted on a curveting steed, it was Zhang Fei who dashed at Xing Daorong with a tremendous roar. Nothing daunted, Xing Daorong rolled up his battle axe and went to meet Zhang Fei. But after four or five bouts, Xing Daorong saw that there was no chance of victory for him, so he turned his horse and ran. Zhang Fei pursued the air shaking with the thunder of his voice. Then the ambushing troops appeared. Xing Daorong, nothing daunted, rushed into their midst. But in front appeared another warrior barring the way, who called out, Do you know me? I am Zhao Zilin of Changshan. Xing Daorong knew that all was over. He could neither fight nor fly. So he dismounted and gave in. He was fettered and taken to camp, where were Liu Bei and Zhu Jiang. Liu Bei ordered him out to execution, but Zhu Jiang hastily checked him. We will accept your submission if you capture Liu Zhang for us, said Zhu Jiang. The captive accepted the offer without the least hesitation. When Zhu Jiang asked how he intended to do it, he replied, If you will set me free, I shall be cunning of speech. If you raid the camp this evening, you will find me your helper on the inside. I will make Liu Zhang a prisoner, and will hand him over to you. He being captured, his father will surrender at once. Liu Bei doubted the good faith of the man, but Zhu Jiang said, Zing Darong is not deceiving. Wherefore Zing Darong was set free and went back to camp, where he related all that had occurred. What can we do? asked Liu Zhang. We can meet trick with trick. Put soldiers in ambush tonight outside our camp, while within everything will appear as usual. When Zhu Jian comes, we shall capture him. The ambush was prepared. At the second watch, an army came out of the darkness and appeared in the gate. Each carried a torch, and they began to set fire to all about them. A dashed Liu Xiang and Xing Darong, and the incendiaries forthwith fled. The two warriors pursued them, but the fugitives ran, and then suddenly disappeared at about three miles from the camp. Much surprised, the two turned to wend their way back to their own camp. It was still burning for no one had extinguished the flames. Soon from behind them came out Zhang Fei. Liu Zhang called out to his companion saying, Do not enter the burning camp, but to go to attack Xu Jiang's stockade. Thereupon they turned again, but at a distance of three miles Zhao Zilong, and an army suddenly debouched upon their road. Zhao Zilong attacked and slew Xing Daran by a spear thrust. Liu Zhang turned to flee, but Zhang Fei was close upon him and made him prisoner. He was thrown across a horse bound and taken to camp. When he saw Zhu Jiang, Liu Zhang said the ruse was Zing Darong's evil counsel. I was forced to follow. Zhu Jiang ordered them to loose his bonds, had him properly dressed and gave him wine to cheer him and help him forget his troubles. When he was recovered, he was told to go to his father and persuade him to yield. And if he does not, the city shall be destroyed and everyone put to death said Zhu Jiang as Liu Zhang left. The son returned to the city and told his father these things. Liu Du at once decided to yield, and forthwith hoisted the flag of surrender, opened the gates, and went out taking his seal of office with him. He was reappointed to his governorship, but his son was sent to Jinju for service with the army. The people of Lingling all rejoiced greatly at the change of rulers. Liu Bei entered the city calmed and reassured the people, and rewarded his army, but he at once began to think of the next move, and asked for an officer to volunteer to take Tiong. Zhao Zilong offered, but Zhang Fei vehemently proposed himself for the command of the expedition, so they wrangled and contended. Then said Zhu Jiang undoubtedly Zhao Zilong was first to volunteer wherefore he is to go, till Zhang Fei opposed and insisted on going. They were told to decide the dispute by drawing lots, and Zhao Zilong drew the winning lot. Zhang Fei was still very angry and grumbled, I would not have wanted any helpers, just three thousand soldiers, and I would have done it. I also only want three thousand soldiers, said Zhao Zilong, and if I fail, I am willing to suffer the penalties. 
Xiu Jiang was pleased that Zhao Ziling recognized his responsibility so fully, and with the commission he gave Zhao Ziling three thousand of veterans. Though the matter was thus settled, Zhang Fei was discontented, and pressed his claim till Liu Bei bade him desist and retire. With his three thousand troops, Zhao Ziling took the road to Guiyong. The governor Zhao Fan soon heard of his approach and hastily called his officers to take counsel. Two of them, Chen Ying and Bao Long, offered to meet the invaders and turn them back. These two warriors belonged to Guiyong and had made themselves famous as hunters. Chen Ying used a flying fork and Bao Long could draw a bow with such force that he had been known to send an arrow through two tigers. So strong were they, as well as bold. They stood before Zhao Fan and said we will lead the way against Liu Bei. The governor replied, I know that Liu Bei is of the imperial family, and Zhu Jiang is exceedingly resourceful. Huan Yu and Zhang Fei are very bold. But the commander of this force is Zhao Ziling, who on one occasion faced a hundred legions of Cao Cao and never blenched. Our small force here cannot stand against such people. We shall have to yield. Let me go out to fight, said Chen Ying. If I cannot capture Zhao Ziling, then you can yield. The governor could not resist him and gave his consent. Then Chen Ying with three thousand troops went forth. Soon the two armies came within sight of each other. When Chen Ying's army was drawn up, he girded on his flying fork and rode to the front. Zhao Ziling gripped his spear and rode to meet him. Zhao Ziling began to rail at Chen Ying, saying, My master is the brother of Liu Bai to whom belong this land. Now he is supporting his nephew, the heir and son of Liu Bai. Having taken Jingzhu, I am come to soothe and comfort the people here. Why then do you oppose me? We are supporters of the Prime Minister Cao Cao, and are no followers of your master, was the reply. Zhao Ziling, waxing angry, firmly grasped his spear and rode forward. His opponent twirled the flying fork and advanced. The horses met, but after four or five encounters, Chen Ying, realizing that there was no hope of victory, turned and fled. Zhao Ziling followed. Suddenly turning, Chen Ying got close to Zhao Ziling and flung the fork. Zhao Ziling deftly caught it and threw it back. Chen Ying dodged away, but Zhao Ziling soon caught him up, seized, dragged him out of the saddle, and threw him to the ground. Then Zhao Ziling called up his soldiers, and they bound the prisoner. Chen Ying was taken to the camp, while his troops scattered and fled. I thought you would not dare come back with me, said Zhao Ziling to the prisoner, when they had returned to camp. However, I am not going to put you to death. You are free, but persuade your master to yield. Chen Ying asked pardon, put his hands over his head, and fed like a frightened rat. When he reached his city, he told the governor all these things. My original desire was to yield, but you insisted on fighting, and this is what it has brought you to. So spoke the governor. He bade Chen Ying be gone, and then prepared his letter of submission, and put up his seal. With a small party Zhao Fan went out of the city, and wended his way to Zhao Zilong's camp. Zhao Zilong received him graciously, offered him wine, and then accepted the seal of office. After the wine had gone round several times, Zhao Fan became talkative, saying, General, your surname is the same as mine, and five centuries ago we were one family. You are from Changshan, and so am I. Moreover, we are from the same village. If you do not mind, we might swear brotherhood. I should be very happy. Zhao Ziling was pleased and they compared ages. They were the same year. However, Zhao Ziling was the elder by four months, and so Zhao Fan made his bow as younger brother. The two men, having so many things in common, were very pleased with each other and seemed fitted to be close friends. At eventide the feast broke up, and the late governor returned to his dwelling. Next day Zhao Fan requested Zhao Ziling to enter the city, where, after Zhao Ziling had assured the people of their safety, he went to a banquet at the state residence. When they had become mellow with wine, the governor invited Zhao Ziling into the inner quarters, where wine was again served. When Zhao Ziling was a little intoxicated, his host bade a woman come forth and offer a cup of wine to the guest. The woman was dressed entirely in white silk, and her beauty was such as to overthrow cities and ruin states. Who is she? asked Zhao Ziling. My sister-in-law. She is of the Fan family. Zhao Ziling at once changed his look and treated her with deference. When she had offered the cup, the host told her to be seated and join the party, 
but Zhao Zion declined this addition to the evening, and the lady withdrew. Why did you trouble your sister-in-law to present wine to me, brother? asked Chao Zilong. There is a reason, said the host, smiling. I pray you let me tell you. My brother died three years ago and left her a widow. But this cannot be regarded as the end of the story. I have often advised her to marry again, but she said she would only do so if three conditions were satisfied in one man's person. The suitor must be famous for literary grace and warlike exploits, secondly handsome and highly esteemed, and thirdly of the same name as our own. Now, where in all the world was such a combination likely to be found? Yet here are you, brother, dignified, handsome, and prepossessing, a man whose name is known all over the wide world, and of the desired name. You exactly fulfill my sister's ambitions. If you do not find her too plain, I should like her to marry you, and I will provide a dowry. What think you of such an alliance, such a bond of relationship? But Zhao Zilong rose in anger, shouting as I have just sworn brotherhood with you, is not your sister-in-law my sister-in-law? How could you think of bringing such confusion into the relationship? Shame suffused Zhao Fan's face, and he said, I only thought of being kind to you. Why are you so very rude to me? Zhao Fan looked right and left to his attendants with murder in his eye. Zhao Zilon raised his fist and knocked him down. Then he strode out of the place mounted and rode out of the city. Zhao Fan at once called in his two generals. Chen Ying said he has gone away in a rage which means that we shall have to fight him. I greatly fear you will lose, said Zhao Fan. We will pretend to be deserters, said Bao Long, and so get among his soldiers. When you challenge him, we will suddenly catch him. We shall have to take some others with us, said Chen Ying. Five hundred troops will be ample, said Bao Long. So in the night the two men and their followers ran over to Zhao Zilong's camp to desert. Zhao Zilong understood the trick they would play, but he called them in, and they said when Zhao Fan tempted you with that fair lady. He wanted to make you drunk and get you into the private apartments, so that he might murder you and send you ahead to Kao Kao. Yes, he was as wicked as the Devon. We saw you go away in anger, and we thought that would mean grave trouble for us, and so we have deserted. Zhao Zilong listened with simulated joy, and he had wine served to the two men, and pressed them to drink so that they were quite overcome. When this was done he had both bound with cords, called up their followers, and asked them whether this was real or pretended desertion, and they told him the truth. Then he gave the soldiers wine and said, Those who wanted to harm me are your leaders and not you. If you do as I tell you, you shall be well rewarded. The soldiers threw themselves to the ground and promised obedience. Thereupon the two leaders Chen Ying and Bao Long were beheaded. Their five hundred troops were made to lead the way and act as screen for a whole thousand of horsemen, and the party set out at full speed for Guiyang. When they got there they summoned the gate and said that they had slain Zhao Zilong and had got back, and they wished to speak with the governor. Those on the wall lighted flares and inspected those at the gate. Surely enough they wore the uniforms of their own people, and Zhao Fan went up to them. He was immediately seized and made prisoner. Then Zhao Zilong entered the city, restored order, and sent off swift messengers to Liu Beihu at once, with his advisor came to Guiyang. When they had taken their seats, the late governor was brought in and placed at the foot of the steps. In response to Zhu Jiang's questions, Zhao Fan related the story of the proposed marriage. Said Zhu Jiang to Zhao Zilong, but this seems a fine project. Why did you receive the proposal so roughly? Zhao Zilong said Zhao Fan and I had just sworn brotherhood, and so marriage with his sister-in-law would have called down on my head universal blame. That is one reason. Another is that I should have made his sister fail to keep her dutiful chastity. And thirdly, I did not know whether I might trust such a proposal from one who had just yielded to force. My lord, your position as a recent victor was one of danger, and could I risk the failure of your plans for my sake? Liu Bei said, but now that the plan has been carried out, and we are victors, would you care to marry her? All my fears for the building of a reputation. Family can come later. You are indeed right, honorable, said Liu Bei. Zhao Fan was released and restored to the governorship. Zhao Zilong was conspicuously rewarded, but Zhang Fei was angry and disappointed. So Zhao Zilong gets all the praise and I am worth nothing, cried he. 
Just give me three thousand soldiers, and I will take ruling and bring you the governor. This pleased Zhu Jiang, who said there is no reason why you should not go, but I will only require one condition of you. Wondrous, the plans of the general, so doth he conquer in battle. Soldiers keenly competing gain renown in the fighting. The condition that Zhu Jiang made will appear in the next chapter.